Hello, I'm Dr. Alice Duncanson, and I work with leukemia patients who've successfully been treated for leukemia, but have relapsed or developed the disease again. This can be very disheartening for patients, but with stem cell transplants, also known as bone marrow transplants, these patients are given hope and a chance at a longer, happier life. Because this treatment has major risks associated with it, patients should try chemotherapy first. I've been working with two patients that have been diagnosed with AML, or acute myeloid leukemia. Sadly, they've both recently had a reoccurrence of their disease. I'm hoping to help them with a stem cell transplant. Leukemia is a cancer of the blood or bone marrow that results when a blood stem cell, called a blast, becomes altered and undergoes abnormally rapid growth. This means that white blood cell blasts accumulate in the bone marrow and interfere with the production of normal blood cells. Symptoms of leukemia include fatigue, bruising and bleeding, pallor, discomfort from enlarged organs, and increased rates of infection, since the white blood cells are not functioning properly as immune cells. Our patients, Wendy and Michael, have been given a pretty tough diagnosis. They fought this disease once, and it went into remission, which means their cancer signs and symptoms were no longer detectable. But now it's back, and they have to deal with this awful occurrence. This can bring out unusual behavior. They might joke around, cry, or get angry. No matter how they act, we never judge our patients for these reactions. Everything is normal when you get a potentially life-threatening diagnosis. Before we meet the patients, let's take a look at their blood samples. This slide shows what an AML cell looks like. The normal cells are the lighter purple, smaller cells you see. The bigger, darker cells are called myeloblasts, which are supposed to occur in the bone marrow. In this case, we can see that these myeloblasts are slightly abnormal, as they have what are called hour rods in them. Those are the long, thin rods inside the cells, and they indicate that the leukemia is back. The patient this blood was taken from had AML. Now look at Wendy's slide. Has her leukemia returned or come out of remission? I agree. Wendy's cancer is back. Now let's look at Michael's slide. Do you see AML cells on the slide? I agree. Unfortunately, Michael's cancer is back too. Now that we've confirmed that their leukemia needs further treatment, let's go talk to our patients. Which one would you like to meet first? Wendy is a 16-year-old Caucasian woman. She was a freshman in high school when she was first diagnosed with leukemia and underwent chemotherapy. The leukemia responded well to the initial chemo. Now, about a year later, they've discovered leukemic cells in her blood. That's why Wendy was referred to me for a stem cell transplant. Hello, Wendy. I'm Dr. Alice Duncanson. I'm here to start the stem cell transplant process, assuming you're ready and aware of the risks. My mom and I have read the paperwork. Boring. You people should use that as a cure for insomnia. But I get what it talks about. I do have a question. How long will all this take? I want to go to junior prom. It's difficult to pin down how long it will take, but we'll do our best to get you to that dance six months from now. The first thing we need to do is find you a matching bone marrow donor in order to do the transplant. Finding a matching donor is challenging sometimes. We look for a match with the patient's full siblings, then relatives, and then we look for an unrelated donor if we can't find a match. Can you help Wendy determine her chance of finding a donor? Click the button next to Wendy's race. Right, as a Caucasian, Wendy has a 66% chance of finding a donor. Those are pretty good odds for a bone marrow donor. Why don't you click some of the other races to see what their likelihood of finding a donor is?
When you look for a donor match, you need to find someone whose human leukocyte antigens, or HLA, match your patients. HLA is a type of protein that's found on the outer surfaces of cells. It's made up of six antigens whose molecules help your body identify which cells belong to your body and which don't. If the HLA doesn't match up, the new immune system being given from the donor will identify the patient's cells as not belonging in the body and attack them. Wendy has two sisters, so we'll begin by testing them. Wendy's sisters start with a simple cheek swab. If more people realized how simple it is to register with a bone marrow donor program, it would make finding a matching donor a lot simpler. Once we've found a match with the cheek swab, we'll do blood tests to confirm our findings. Look at Wendy's HLA profile and the profiles of her two sisters. You need at least five of six factors matching to do any transplant. In this case, six of six is recommended. Click the HLA factors that you think are a match for Wendy's. Great news! We found a match for Wendy! The transplant starts with counseling for both patients and their families about what to expect and what will be happening. This is not a procedure to be taken lightly. Risks include the body rejecting the graft, leaving the patient without an immune system, developing graft versus host disease when the new cells we transplant begin to attack the cells of the patient's body, and reacting unfavorably to the high doses of chemotherapy before the transplant. There are even more risks associated with the fact that the patient will essentially be lacking an immune system for an extended period of time. They could contract any number of infections before the transplant takes hold and begins producing new immune cells. The first step after counseling is called conditioning. This consists of high doses of chemotherapy that rid the body of the leukemic cells and the patient's immune system to make room in the bone marrow for the new stem cells we'll be adding. Wendy will remain in this room with special airflow that prevents bacteria from entering for the duration of this procedure because we're essentially shutting off her immune system. With the leukemic and stem cells killed off, there's now room in the bone marrow for the new cells. We'll administer the new stem cells taken from our donor, Wendy's sister, Maggie. Maggie was given a drug to stimulate the production of the stem cells and cause them to move into her bloodstream. We collected the stem cells from her blood and will now give them to Wendy. The stem cells are given via IV over a period of about two to four hours. We introduce them slowly to prevent the number of cells in the IV bag from overwhelming Wendy's system and gathering in the blood vessels of the lungs. Hang the bag of stem cells from the pole. Then attach the line from the bag to Wendy's central line. This will feed the stem cells into Wendy's system, allowing the stem cells to migrate to the bone marrow and begin growing there. Now we wait. Wendy will need about three weeks to really begin growing new stem cells. Wendy, it's been about three weeks. How are you feeling? Kind of bored. Plus, I'm getting as pale as a ghost. Why can't you have tanning beds in here? I've got nothing to do but watch my parents pretend nothing is wrong. Can't my friends come and visit? We're getting closer, but no friends just yet. Maybe in another few weeks, when your immune system is better capable of fighting off an infection. Ah! I'll be insane by then! What we're waiting for is the transplanted stem cells to start producing new white blood cells, which are the human body's disease fighters. To determine this, we take regular blood counts. When a type of white blood cell called a neutrophil reaches 500 cells per microliter of blood, Wendy's immune system will be working again. We can discharge her and allow her to go home. Even then, her new immune system won't be fully up to speed. She'll need to stay indoors and be careful of what she eats so she doesn't get any foodborne illnesses. Let's look at her blood draws and see what we can see. This slide has exactly one-tenth of a microliter of blood on it. Count the neutrophils in each section of the grid 
and keep track of how many you have. Then multiply that number by 10. That will give you the number of neutrophils in a microliter of blood. Remember that our patients should have at least 500 neutrophils per microliter of blood in order to go home. Does Wendy have 500 or more neutrophils per microliter? This is great. Wendy's neutrophil count is more than 500. Finally, some good news for Wendy. We can discharge her after checking the rest of her vital signs. Let's take a look at her blood pressure and temperature. Well, you got the answer right, but it's not good news. Wendy's temperature is too high. I'm afraid she can't go home just yet. Ah! Uh... All right, we've waited a few days. Let's test Wendy's vitals again. Fantastic! We can discharge Wendy. Of course, we'll continue doing blood counts for her and monitoring her health at regular intervals. Woohoo! I'm going home! Since Wendy was released three weeks ago, she's been getting regular blood tests. Her neutrophil counts have been in an acceptable range between 500 and 1,000 per microliter of blood, which is really good news. Today, Wendy is in for a follow-up physical and blood count. How are you feeling today? Not good at all. I've got a rash all over, and I'm all blown up like a balloon. To top it all off, I've got diarrhea. I spend more time in the bathroom than in bed. Hmm, that's odd. What do you think the problem might be? That's what I was thinking. She's experiencing graft versus host disease, or GVHD. That means that immune cells, called T cells, are being created by the stem cells we transplanted. These donor T cells are treating Wendy's cells as foreign bodies and are attacking them. That's why she has a variety of symptoms. The cells in the skin, liver, and intestinal tract are all being attacked. The first line of treatment is to readmit Wendy to the hospital. Not again! We'll administer a type of steroid that reduces inflammation and suppresses the immune system. This therapy has its own set of side effects, but might give Wendy some relief. I think the inflammation-reducing steroid could do the trick. Wendy went home after a few days of steroids, and she's now back for another checkup after a week. So, how's it going? Have you seen a reduction in the GVHD symptoms? I feel better than before. No more bloated feeling and, bonus, no more 10 trips to the bathroom an hour. Things are better, but my face feels swollen. I'm pleased that Wendy is feeling better, but this continued swelling in the face is cause for concern. We need to do something for her. Which course of treatment would you recommend to Wendy and her family? The experimental treatment involves injecting multipotent adult progenitor cells, or MAPSIs, into the patient. The MAPSIs should help to modulate the T-cell response, prevent damage to the organs and intestinal walls, reduce the diarrhea, and help to reduce the overall severity of the GVHD, possibly even curing it. However, as with all clinical trials, there are risks. In this case, the risks are that we don't know that this will work, 
and we don't exactly know what side effects might develop in humans. There might be the possibility of an allergic type reaction, or these cells might accumulate in the blood vessels of the lungs, or eventually cause tumors themselves. While none of that has been observed in studies with mice, it hasn't been tested in humans. If this were you, click on what you would do. Your choice is good for you. Let's see what Wendy's choice is. What decision have you and your parents come to? Listen, Doc, if this might allow me to live a normal life, I'm going for it. I mean, come on, it can't be as bad as when Ken Shouse puked on me during school photos in seventh grade. Wendy, it's important that you understand that this is a treatment that may help you, but it has the potential to cause more problems in the long run. I need to know you understand this. No, really, Doc, I read all the stuff. We discussed it, and my parents and I agree. We want to try this. After careful consideration, Wendy and her family have chosen to participate in the clinical trial. They filled out a raft of paperwork to enter the trial, and now Wendy is getting stem cells through an IV. These MAPSIs do not have to be matched to the patient because although these cells do have HLA antigens on their cell membranes, they do not create strong immune responses. This means the MAPSIs from one universal donor can be used in all patients, similar to the way type O blood can be used in different people. Wendy has been in the hospital for the three weeks since the MAPSI infusion. So how are you feeling now? You look much better. Hey, Doc. I feel way better. No more swelling. No more you-know-whats. Thanks for being there for me. Graduation is going to be a blast, and I'm going to look like me. We'll continue to monitor her for GVHD, leukemia cells, and any side effects that might develop from the treatment. But for now, Wendy's system is clean and without side effects. She can graduate and go on to pursue her college career. More clinical trials will be required before this treatment is available to all patients. The treatment may not even make it through the rest of the clinical trials required, but it is looking very promising at the moment. Certainly, Wendy is happier for having had it. Woohoo! I'm out of here! This is Michael. He's a 50-year-old African-American male who was diagnosed with leukemia about a year ago. Now, after two chemotherapy treatments, he has relapsed again. This means that leukemic cells have been found in his blood once more. Michael's come to me to discuss the possibilities of a stem cell transplant. Hello, Michael. I'm Dr. Alice Duncanson. How are you feeling? Great. Well, <laughs> aside from the leukemia, I have a new grandbaby. Uh, would you like to see the pictures? They're beautiful. Let's get started on making you well again so you can play with that baby. To start the transplant process, we have to find a matching bone marrow donor for Michael. Take a quick look at the statistics for the donor pool. Michael's likelihood is less than 25%, which are not great odds. This is due to the fact that most bone marrow registries are found in the U.S. and European countries that are primarily Caucasian, Hopefully, over time, more minority and mixed-race people will agree to become donors, increasing the survival rates of leukemia patients that are not Caucasian. When you look for a donor match, what you're really looking for is someone whose human leukocyte antigens, or HLA, match your patient. HLA is a type of protein that's found on the outer surfaces of cells. HLA is made up of six antigens. These antigens help your body identify which cells belong to your body and which don't. If the HLA doesn't match up, the new donated immune system will identify the patient cells as not belonging and attack them. When looking for matches, we typically start with siblings. However, Michael's only sibling is a half-brother, so he would have the same likelihood of a match as the general population. This makes the situation even tougher for Michael, but I'll start the request for a match and we'll see what we come up with. I was afraid of this. We were unable to find a match for him in the bone marrow donor registry. 
Michael is actively encouraging his African-American friends and his extended family to become registered as donors, but we can't wait for a match. It often takes weeks or even months for the people registering today to end up in the database. Those helpful people that register could very well save another life, but I think for Michael, we need to look at the Cord Blood Donor Registry for a match. Cord blood is donated by women that deliver babies. They're asked if they want to donate, and the placenta is taken, and the blood is collected from it through the umbilical cord. It turns out this blood, known as cord blood, is a rich source of hematopoietic, or blood, stem cells. The cord blood is taken and stored in special banks for future uses, like this one. In cases of an incomplete match, cord blood is more flexible. Umbilical cord blood contains immature immune cells that are less likely to attack the patient's immune system. Because of this, four out of six HLA antigen matches are acceptable for cord blood donors. For a bone marrow donor match, a minimum of five out of six HLA antigens matching is required. I've discovered that there's only one cord blood donor that might match Michael. Look at the antigens. Remember, four out of six antigens need to match. Do you think we have a match here? Excellent. I'm so glad someone decided to donate cord blood. This is the difference between life and death for Michael. There might be one more hoop to jump through, though. While one donor is normally enough for a bone marrow transplant, sometimes there aren't enough stem cells in the cord blood to do the job. In that case, we need two cord donors. But we received good news from the stem cell biologists associated with the cord blood bank. They're indicating that we do have enough cells in the matching sample to proceed with the transplant. The transplant starts with counseling for both patients and their families about what to expect and what will be happening. This is not a procedure to be taken lightly. Risks include rejecting the graft and being left without an immune system, developing graft versus host disease when the new cells we transplant begin to attack the cells of the patient's body, and reacting unfavorably to the high doses of chemotherapy before the transplant. Other risks are associated with the fact that the patient will essentially be lacking an immune system for a while. They could contract any number of infections before the transplant takes hold and begins producing new immune cells. The first step after counseling is called conditioning. Michael will receive high doses of chemotherapy to rid the body of the leukemic cells and the patient's immune system to make room in the bone marrow for the new stem cells we'll be adding. Michael must remain in this room with special airflow that prevents bacteria from entering for the duration of this procedure because we're essentially shutting off his immune system. Any infection he contracts could be life-threatening at this point. Michael's conditioning phase is over and we'll start the transplant. Now we will administer the new stem cells taken from the donor cord blood. The cells were frozen and have been thawed and washed. They'll be administered via syringe. The injection lasts about 10 minutes. This is to prevent the cells in the syringe from overloading the patient's system and gathering in the blood vessels of the lungs. The stem cells will travel to the bone marrow and begin producing new blood cells there. Take the syringe filled with stem cells and screw it onto the port of the central line. Then slowly depress the plunger. This will feed the stem cells into the patient slowly allowing them to migrate to the bone marrow and begin growing there. Michael, how are you doing? Oh, I'm fine. A bit lonely. There's only so many times I can watch MacGyver reruns. My kids and grandkids' phone calls keep my spirits up. Uh, did I show you the new photos of my grandkids yet? We're waiting for the transplanted stem cells to begin producing new white blood cells. Blood counts determine when a type of white blood cell called a neutrophil reaches 500 cells per microliter of blood. When it hits that number for three days in a row, Michael's immune system will be working again. We can discharge him and allow him to go home. 
Even then, we don't want to severely stress his new immune system, so Michael will need to stay indoors and be careful of what he eats so he doesn't get any foodborne illnesses. On the bright side, he'll be on the road to recovery. Let's look at Michael's blood and see what we can see. Add this liquid, Ficol, to help separate the cells by size. I'll put the blood sample in the centrifuge and spin it down. Use a pipette to remove the white blood cells from the middle of the test tube. I'll put these cells in the cell counter. The diluted white cells are passed through a flow cell, which releases cells one at a time through a capillary tube past a laser beam. The scattering of light from each cell is analyzed by sophisticated software, giving a count of the likely distribution of different types of cells. Remember that our patient should have at least 500 neutrophils per microliter of blood in order to go home. Do you think Michael is ready to go home? We'll wait another week on Michael and see if his neutrophil counts increase. Okay, so we'll keep Michael in the hospital at least another week to get his white counts up. This is not unusual after a cord blood transplant, as these stem cells take longer to engraft than bone marrow stem cells. Also, older patients take a bit longer to recover from a stem cell transplant. Michael's count was good, and he was released three weeks ago. Since then, he's been getting regular blood tests for his white counts, and to look for the return of any leukemic cells. No leukemic cells have been found, which is great news. His neutrophil counts have been in an acceptable range between 500 and 1,000 per microliter of blood, which is also good news. Today, Michael is in for a follow-up physical and blood count. How are you feeling today? Well, you know, I feel pretty good. Can't see myself running the Boston Marathon anytime soon, but... <laughs> I never did that before. I'm able to throw a ball with the grandkids, which is what's important to me. Did I show you my latest photos? Michael's blood pressure, temperature, and white counts are normal. He also feels fairly good and is good to go home until his next checkup. We'll keep doing regular checkups for up to one year after the transplant procedure. Checkups will continue for five years while gradually reducing the frequency. Thanks for your help. Not only have we cured Wendy and Michael's leukemia, we've restored Wendy's quality of life with a new treatment. Thanks again for helping with this research. As you can see, stem cells have great promise to help people and positively impact or extend lives. What other ways do you think stem cell research might help people?